very much. Really appreciate it, Bridget. And uh, thanks for having me on. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak. I've had the privilege to be able to talk at, a, at two uh, Spayapaloozas, which was a lot of fun. So some of you that have been there, probably some of this may be a little bit redundant. There might be some new stuff in or might be some new photographs or that type of stuff. But uh, we're going to just kind of uh, get the presentation going here. We'll, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are and how we got started and, and kind of what we do. And then we'll kind of just touch on some of the successes we've had or some of the, some of the information that we've learned that's uh, uh, pretty unique to these fish. And, uh, and then some of the concerns that, that uh, we're seeing uh, due to some of this recent, the most recent type study. So let me see if I can get this up. Did I, do, I hit, do I hit share screen first? You do hit share screen, and then it should give you an option of uh, which window you'd like to share with us. Okay. Should be a little pop up at the very bottom. Are you able to see that pop up at the bottom? Yeah, I just got to I've got to find this file. I'm looking for the file right now. Okay. And while you're doing that, Greg, would you prefer to have questions at the end, or would you uh, welcome people to unmute themselves and ask they, while you do the presentation? They can interrupt any time they want. Okay. I can find Why is that coming up? I haven't seen anything just yet. I'm hitting the share screen right now. If you hit, uh, there's a little arrow right next to the share screen. Well, let's see. Yeah, so you should just be able to click share screen and then select uh, which screen you'd like to share. There should be a couple that pop up. And then once you do that, you can hit share in the bottom right hand corner.
got the presentation up on my screen. Like, well, let's see, share screen, click on share screen. Mm -hmm. About now. I'm seeing a presentation. Looks like it worked. Okay. Awesome. That looks great, Greg. Good. Okay. So the coalition was started about uh, almost five years ago now, and the main reason for it was uh, that there was a project to study coastal cutthroat trout by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, but they didn't have any funds to carry out the project. Probably not too unusual. Uh, so anyhow, the, a couple of people in the department reached out to some avid anglers that were here in the South Sound, myself included, to see if we could maybe do something about that. And uh, so that was the impetus of the, of the whole program. So, you know, why start the coalition? And some of this stuff is, you know, it's a non, as, you, as everybody knows, of course, the cutthroat trout are not, they're not, a, they're not a commercial fish. And I think that's probably part of their salvation. Uh, they're not ESA listed, so they don't get an awful lot of, a lot of love in the department. Uh, that last point, not a salmon, not a trout. That's, that's, I don't know why that got even put in there. They, are, they certainly are the trout. Uh, but they're important uh, in the state of Washington. Uh, they're one of our two really native wild trout, steelhead and then coastal cutthroat trout. They've been around a long time, and uh, we'd like to know a lot about them so that we can manage them better. Some people that started the organization you can see on the, are, are those folks that you can see on the screen right now. I think maybe some people know Leland Milwaukee from Orvis. Um, some of you know James Losey from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So these other guys were just the avid people that stepped up and decided that they wanted to help put this thing together. Uh, this is the current board of directors. Unfortunately, we lost one of our directors at large. Bill Young just passed away a few weeks ago down in Shelton. Uh, he was a, a major, major part of coastal research, of course, the cutthroat research for the Department of Fish and Wildlife for, for years and years and years. But that's the current board. Uh, we are part of Hood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group. We merged with them in 2016, late in 2016. So we're part of that 5013C. We have our own board. But I also sit on the board of Hood Cadell Salmon Enhancement Group, and I answer directly to Mendy Harlow, who is the executive director of the board. So when we, as an organization, look at some kind of a project that's been brought towards us for funding, uh, if we agree on it and it looks like it's something we want to do, then we propose that and have a second. Uh, we have the board of Hood Cadell Salmon Enhancement Group look at it also to see if it really meets our. Uh, our mission statement, if you will. And uh, so there's, there's good oversight over what we do. This is the board of uh, directors at Wood Canal Salmon Enhancement Group. Uh, some really, really qualified people. They've done a wonderful job out there, as have a number of the FEGs throughout Washington State on salmon and habitat, uh, salmon habitat recovery. But uh, we share the same watersheds that a lot of the of Wood Canals works in. and. We use their uh, their uh, biologists as well as the state of Washington biologists. When we started it up, we decided we needed to have some funds, and so we reached out to the fishing community. And uh, certainly, North Sound was one of the chapters that was involved right in the beginning. And I think Chris is on the line right now too. And so. Uh, Everybody was very, very generous with the funds that they had, but we realized we weren't really kind of going to make that $100,000 goal. So we reached out more to the fishing community, to buy shops and, and angling organizations and, and, uh, and, and equipment manufacturers as well. And we found a, a lot of people had a shared love of this fish and were really willing to 
step up with with funding but we still were kind of short on the end and so then we reached out a little bit further and we got just the general public involved that really understood what we were doing science wise and we got I think Georgetown Brewery has been a big supporter of us. Taylor Shellfish has been a supporter of us. The Suquamish tribe, the Squawks and tribe, Mankey Lumbers let us use a lot of their lands. And uh, so uh, we really, really have got this to be quite a, quite a large thing. But what do we do? Well, we raise funds. Uh, and we do that through donations and, and events and grants and, and uh, overall to try to fund research that's strictly related to coastal cutthroat trout. Uh, the organization itself, some of our people are involved directly in the science. We go out and we speak at schools, uh, universities, talk about what we're doing and why we think it's important. Uh, and then we try to get involved between the public uh, fishing and community as well as, uh, as the scientific community and try to involve volunteers when we can. It's a little bit difficult on some of the pure science work that we that we do, but as, we, as we're learning a little bit about a canal and a project in Hood Canal, uh, we've got a project now that's gonna be able to involve the uh, fishing community we're really, really excited about. We reach out a number of different ways. We're very active social media wise. We've got an Instagram feed, we've got a, a Facebook site as well, and then of course, our website is coastalcutthroatcoalition.com. That's where all of our published papers are and, and that type of stuff. But on social media, which you're seeing up there right now, and we'll talk about this in just a little bit, this is a project that's ongoing on a particular uh, parasite that we're finding in Puget Sound that's really, really on the upswing. Uh, it's an argulid. It's, it's, uh, it's a parasite that's specific to coastal cutthroat trout. So we wanted to try to involve the angling community. And uh, so we put a site on our website where you can go and you can click on that, get all the information. And if you catch fish with or without these parasites on them, you can record that on, on the website. And then we put your name into a, into a drawing and, and give somebody some kind of a little gift every, every month. So we do that like there's a, these are in, Instagram sites, posts and, uh, James Losey is the one that keeps the, that, that, that Instagram site up and he's normally posting something pretty much every week. That's his beautiful wife that is, is, has a mask on long before we were even supposed to have masks on. So <laughs> it was trendy a few years ago. But uh, those are a couple of people that got drawn out and, and got mugs or buffs or shirts or something. And I'm covered up on that last one, but that's just a research paper that you can see on, on our website as well. Uh, as you can see, a lot of people kind of want to what, what we do. This is the last kind of snapshot of some of our funding. Uh, you can see that uh, up until right now, uh, of, all the, of all the funds we've raised, there's only been $275 that have been spent that's not spent on research. Everything else has been spent on research. Uh, and you can just see some of the stuff that's around. Uh, I don't know if you can follow the cursor or not. These are pit tags, number of dollars a piece, pit tag readers, hundreds of dollars a piece, scales, nets, uh, all sorts of equipment. When you're running samples for genetic sampling, it's about $50, 48 50 a, a, a sample. And when you're running thousands of samples, uh, it, it gets expensive really, really quickly. Everything else is all volunteer over here. So uh, the administration, education, outreach, fundraising, all that stuff uh, is none is non-reimbursed. I'm not reimbursed for anything. Uh, none of the none of the other directors are as well. We volunteer our time. We volunteer our own money for hotels and all that type of stuff. So. Uh, I think it's less than one, one point one five five percent of all of our money raised uh, has has gone completely to our, our research efforts. Uh, again, some of the things that we do we're placing pit tags here, uh, pit tag, uh, looking at at uh, red surveys right here, an antenna at this area that reads the pit tag. 
uh, to show you how we've been able to leverage funds. We wanted to do what this is. What this is a pit tag study that was being done in Deep South Sound. Well, we priced that out to have somebody else do what we wanted to do, and you can see that it was around a little over twenty-nine thousand dollars for one site. And by leveraging funds through the Department of Fish and Wildlife, we were able to do that same site for fifteen thousand six hundred dollars. So. Uh, we were able to really make our dollars go a long way by having a great, great partnership with the Department of Wildlife. They've been wonderful to work with. If we can raise the funds for projects, they allow their employees to spend the time on those projects, and uh, it, it's been a wonderful relationship. So we always say that everybody's invited. Uh, as long as somebody is interested in coastal cutthroat trout and their survival, then you're part of the party. Uh, we don't turn anybody away. We're not a fishing organization. We don't have an agenda other than trying to get science data that will help us manage coastal cutthroat trout uh, for years and years and years to come. So let's talk about some of the research. Uh, this slide, I think maybe some of you people have seen, all it shows, Okay, we're going to be able to keep going here. All that it shows is we really have a lot of trout a while ago, and we don't have as many now. And we know that. And in 1999, the Fish and Wildlife made coast to cutthroat trout catch and release in the marine environment, and they thought that they would see a big uptick uh, in fish because of that. They thought that retention was the main reason. But as you can see, if you can kind of view where 2000 or 1999 would be somewhere around here, you can see it's been pretty flat lined up until about 2015. We saw our first little uptick in fish at different trap sites. The range of coastal cutthroat trout is from the Eagle River in Northern California, all the way up to Southeast Alaska. That mirrors the temperate rainforest along the west side of the Pacific Ocean, or the east coast of the Pacific Ocean. But, and uh, I don't think that that is uh, unique. I think the same thing with Pacific salmon in that same area as well. It's a, it's a synergy between that area and the fish for sure. This is a study area that we work in down in the deep south sound primarily on these initial projects for spreading out now. But initially, this is where we we have done most of our work and so we were looking at a few different things we were looking at spawn timing we were looking at abundance we were looking at the migration of these fish and we've learned some stunning things uh, these three particular streams are very similar in their makeup uh, they uh, share about the same distance the gravel matrix is about the same but for some reason, after when we did our initial testing, we found some things that were really, really unique. Uh, so what we did originally is we went into these streams and took genetic samples of the fresh water. And then we gave those to the geneticists in Olympia and they, we wanted to find out if in fact these fish were genetically distinct or were they all just Oncorhynchus clarki clarki, of course, the cutthroat trout. And what we found amazingly was that they are they are distinct with their genetics. Although they're very close together, and there's even another small stream that is right in this area, and uh, it also is genetically distinct, although it, we may have some stream sharing uh, in the little skookum, but the fish out of Elson Creek, which is here, which is less than a mile long, very, very productive stream uh, is also unique. And now we're in about nine streams and we're seeing the exact same thing. But once we did that, we went out into the marine environment and we took samples out of the marine environment and did the exact same thing. And the results that we'll share right now are really kind of remarkable. Uh, Okay. 
these are just some of the, I don't know how this slide got plugged in there. These are just some of the ways that we do our work. So, you know, we initially use jaw tagging, which is an elastomer tag that's up here. We inject colored tag and underneath the jaw of the fish. Then we used Floyd tags for a while with a number on them that people could call in if they caught that fish. Uh, and then we now we use, you know, pit tag for everything that we do. We use scale analysis, we use otolith analysis out of deceased fish when we can find them. Uh, expression of milk, milk, you know, whether they're ripe or not, you know, the templates, the genetics, pretty much the same things that you guys do as well. So we're going to catch up with those slides, I thought, I, I'm sure in just a minute. So when we looked at spawning, that was the first thing that we wanted to look at. Uh, once we found out these fish were distinct, we wanted to know when they spawned. If you look at all the books, most of the books will tell you they spawn from January till March. Uh, but we've now pretty much got new data that really shows that's not the case. In Skookum Creek, McLean Creek, and Kennedy Creek, we've been walking those streams now for well, Skookum Creek for almost 16 years and uh, the other creeks for about 10 to 12. We walk those, I think, pretty similar to maybe what some of you folks do as well. We walk them once a week, every week water dependent, of course, from January until we find the last red. And uh, that's normally sometime into the first part of June. So they have a long protracted spawning season versus all the other salmon. Just what the pay, what a, what a pit looks like. Bill Young, unfortunately, no longer with us. You can see on the left that we have different years we have different red counts but we average about a hundred reds per year in Skookum Creek and you can see that on the on the right hand side that we have peaks during those years sometimes it, you can see that 2013 it was, it was highest in February um, in 2011 it was more in May uh, March, April, and in 2009. So it, it's, it's interesting that they spawn for a long period of time and, and there's no real rhyme or reason we didn't think for why they spawn different months. So one of the things that we decided to do was we went back historically and we looked at the flows for those streams during the same period of time. And what we did was we put flow charts over the spawning charts. And what we found was, is when we have very high flows, we have very low spawning. And when we have very low flows, we have very high spawning. It's just almost the opposite of all the other salmonids. And I think that's nothing more due to the fact that physiologically, these fish are so much smaller. They can't hack really hard water for spawning. So they need, they like to see the water somewhere between like 48 and 52 degrees and enough water to help move the small aggregate that they move, that they, that they spawn in too much, of course, washes the eggs out, not enough, it won't let them move the deal. So we really think now what we've seen is that water flow is really, really determines how successfully they're spawning in. Shows the same thing, they show an increase in reds with, with low duck discharge on the side. And as the discharge increases, the spawning counts decrease. So we've really pinned down spawning now. And books from now on will certainly reference the fact that they have this elongated spawning. And that's really important when you're trying to make decisions for when you open fishing seasons and that type of stuff. If you open a fishing season, in say the latter part of May, like we do now, in numerous streams that have a retention fishery for cutthroat, you can in fact be catching and killing spawning fish. And at the least you're walking on spawning reds. So that's information now that the department never had before. So let's look at some marine movement and where they go. What we know is that when these fish come out of their 
two year rearing period in fresh water and enter the salt water, <clears throat> they will find a beach somewhere near their natal stream. And for whatever reason, and we don't know exactly why, those fish will choose that beach and they will spend their entire life on that beach, except for a couple of times. During the summer, they will travel large, long distances for them. And of course, they don't, they say these fish are anadromous. They're really semi anadromous because they don't make long, long uh, runs like steelhead and salmon do. Normally, they're somewhere between five and seven miles of their natal stream. In the summer, we find them about 20 to 22 miles away from their natal stream. But the rest of the time, they're on that beach somewhere. They may be biting, they may not be biting, of course. And then, of course, they leave that beach, of course, to spawn. So we're back to now to the lower deep sound, and now we'll see what we did. So we took the samples that we were talking about uh, in the fresh water and in the salt water. And when we ran the salt water samples, this is what we found. We found that 77% of all the fish caught in the deep south sound come out of one stream. They come out of Skookum Creek. And so what we did was, what you would think is that if Skookum Creeks that feed Skookum Inlet, you would expect to find Skookum Creek fish there. You would expect to find Kennedy Creek fish in Totten Inlet. And you would expect to find McLean Creek fish in Eld Inlet. And then out in this particular area, you might see a mix. So this is what we found. We found that in Skookum Creek, 96% of the, or Skookum Inlet, 96% of the fish were Skookum fish. And a small percentage were McLean fish. In, in Totten Inlet, which is much, much bigger, 85% of the fish came from Skookum Creek, and a small percentage of the fish came from Kennedy Creek, which you would not expect. And then some came from creeks that we were, that we hadn't got any genetic data out of. Outside at the farther end of Totten Inlet, we saw the same thing, except now we see a few McLean Creek fish, but still prominently they are Skookum Creek fish. And then when we got to McLean, it's about 50-50 McLean Creek fish in Eld Inlet, that's where Evergreen State College is. And then the rest of the fish that we caught there were McLean or uh, Skookum Creek fish too. Well, out in the other sound area, out by Squawks and Island, uh, South saw the same thing. And so really what we've kind of determined was is that there's mixed stock fisheries in Deep South Sound, but Skookum Creek is disproportionately represented in that fishery. And so what that shows us is that Skookum Creek is really, really important and we really have to pay attention to the health of that creek. Now, one of the things that we did with the pit tag study that goes on off along with this is we were trying to figure out how many fish are in Puget Sound. One of the techniques to use is, of course, is to count reds. And so we know how many reds there are per year. And then the other thing you can do is you can tag fish and then you can try to count those fish while they're in the stream. And we do that by pit tagging. So we pit tag fish. And as you'll see in a little bit, there's an antenna, there's, there's an antenna site down here, there's an antenna site where we have a rear, there's an antenna site up in the spawning area. So Skookum Creek is eight miles long, about eight miles long. They only use two and a half miles of that stream to, to spawn in. And so if you can count fish over an antenna and count reds at the same time, you can get an estimate of fish per red. And right now, it's somewhere between 1.9 and 2.1, somewhere around there. So we're averaging it out to two fish per red, but like, you know, we're seeing, we, we, we snorkel these streams and sometimes you'll see a female with four adult males with her, or you might see a female with two adults and, a, and an immature fish with her. So it varies, but right now we're looking at two fish. So if you average a hundred reds per year in Skookum Creek and two fish per red, that stream only has 200 adult fish on an annual basis in it. Uh, so it's not very many, and certainly less in, in McLean Creek and, 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 uh, and in Kennedy Creek. 
So we know quite a bit about their movement. Uh, this is again, count wise, talked about the same thing. When, when do we see more fish? We certainly see them in the fall and the winter. Don't see as many fish around in, the, in April, May, certainly June. So one of the things that we found was when we talked about these fish go out and they find their own beach. One of the things when we beach same these, these sites, we find that we're catching the same fish over and over all the time. And, and that's really unusual. We call that high site fidelity. This is a particular fish that was caught in Totten Inlet or in Eld Inlet down on the Evergreen State College Beach. And this is when we were using colored tags underneath the jaw. So this fish was caught on August 17th and it had all these numerous colored tags in its jaw. Kind of looks like a Christmas tree. So we went back and we dated these marks. And what we found was we caught that fish first in January on that beach. And then we caught that fish again in February on the same beach. And then we caught it on March on the same beach. And then we caught it in April on the same beach. And then we didn't see it again until August. So April, May, June, it took off. It came back later in August and we caught it on that particular day. So what this shows is a couple of things. It shows that this high site fidelity, and now we've taken this a lot further and we're doing it with pit tags. And so we've gotten much, much more data than, than our, our originally when this particular photo was, was taken. So, so now when we, when, uh, we don't do this jaw tagging anymore. Uh, interestingly on that same beach, when we, I showed you earlier a picture of a Floyd tag, that was that orange tag with a number on it. We had a fish on the same beach where this fish came from with a Floyd tag in it. And seven different anglers caught that fish over about a five month period of time. And they called us with a number on it and said, I got this fish with this number on it. What can you tell me about it? So we can tell them that it was a male that originally caught on this date. It was this big. And, uh, and, and we can pass that information on to them. So this high site fidelity is something that's unique to coastal cutthroat trout. Also on that beach one day, another little anecdote is kind of funny. We pulled in there to do some beach sailing and there was a fellow fishing there. He said, we don't really want to interrupt your fishing. He said, don't worry about it. He said, I've been here for three hours and I haven't got a bite. So he said, can I watch the, the netting? He said, certainly you can watch. And so we did. And as they ran the net, they caught like 50 or 60 fish. <laughs> while he'd been fishing there for like the three hours. So they're on these beaches. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna bite or they move around on the beach to some degree, but shows a couple of different things. Fishing wise, uh, catch and release works. And the second thing is this high site fidelity is important. Uh, just like we said on spawning, why is spawning time important? And why is site fidelity important? High site fidelity is important because anglers are anglers. I know we all know where we can go catch fish. And certainly down here in the deep south sound, central sound, lots of people have favorite beaches they go fish. And so the assumption is I can go fish this beach every day and I, I, I and we gotta have a lot of fish because I catch them. Another guy said, hey, I got a beach I go to and we can catch fish on it whenever I want. So there's gotta be a zillion of these fish. But what we know now for a fact is that you're actually catching the same fish over and over all the time. And that has some ramifications to hooking mortality. Even if you catch the fish and release it, if it's fought too long, it really opens up itself to predation from herons, from otters, from seals, uh, from anything else. So uh, good catch and release, catching these fish quickly, landing them, letting them go, uh, not trying to fight them on a two weight and be you know, real sporty about it. It's that, it yeah, they really need to be taken and, and, and hooked and caught as quickly as can and released so they can not build up too much lactic acid. So right now, of course, we're using we're using pit tags. What do I want to go? I want to go to so we're using pit tags, and this, again, this is the antenna down here that they go under. 
So marine movement wise, we're gonna just talk quickly a little bit more about movement to show so that we're knowing now where they go and kind of where they hang out. This fish, this particular fish was caught on a beach and taught an inlet, and it was caught in November, it was caught in December on the same beach, and then we didn't catch him again until April back on the same beach. So what he did was, so we caught him and then we found him in March in the spawning site area and then he showed back up in April back on his same beach and then we found him a year later dead in the creek so they certainly travel from their beach to their spawning areas and then back to their beaches again. Kind of, this was a little bit outdated. So you can see there's about 1,250 cutthroat that were tagged. Uh, captured about 1,700. They're not all, they're not all tags because they're too small. At this time, the recapture rate was about 15% every month. Sometimes it was higher. Sometimes it was as high as 100% of the fish we caught in one month, we'd caught them the previous month. Um, again, just some movement. Here's a fish that was tagged in January. We detected in July and we left the array. So this is the, this is the spawning. This is where our weir is, where we catch them coming up and going back down in a weir and we tag them, count them. This is another antenna site. This is a, a netting site. And so it just, just kind of shows what these fish do. Uh, they're very, very predictable. And one of the things that's unique about these fish is that you know, the process of going from fresh water to salt and salt water to fresh is very, very hard physiologically on fish. Uh, salmon do it outbound and inbound. Steelhead can do it a, a, a number of times like cutthroat do. But cutthroat can do it not only a couple of times a year, they will do it often during a month. And even in some areas, we'll find them going across the antennas multiple times during the day between fresh and salt water. And it may be because there's in the deep south sound, you've got a lot of streams. So maybe the salinity is not quite as high as in some, other, in some of the other areas, but it's something that's really unique. This fish did the same thing. Just again, we're just letting you know that they, they go from the salt water to the fresh water back to their other beach and, and back and forth. So we know kind of what they do now movement wise. Uh, some of the concerns that we have, one of the concerns is is that when we when we net these fish monthly and we take scale samples, we look at age and we look for spawning events. And one of the things that we're seeing over the last two years is that fish that are age-wise, four or five years old, maybe six years old fish, fish that are somewhere between 14 and 19 inches, who should have spawned multiple times, haven't spawned at all, or have only spawned once. We have a really good study that was done back in the 80s when fish could still be killed in McLean Creek. And we took otolith readings back at that time. So the otolith bone is a bone in the ear of the fish. It's like a recorder. It'll tell us everything we want to know about that fish because of a chemical that's deposited on that bone. It'll tell us when the fish was born. It'll tell us whether its mother was a saltwater fish or a freshwater fish. It'll tell us how many times the fish went into salt water and back into fresh water. And that particular study showed these fish of the same size in the same year class had spawned three times, maybe four times. And we just are not seeing that now. And we don't know why that is, but it's really, really concerning. And one of the things that we did was when we started to see this a few years ago, we started trying to keep all the throat that we could find by people walking streams, counting salmon reds or whatever, or do we lose a fish during the netting process? 
we cut we kept those fish and we took a scale sample off them and we took the order without at the same time and we saved all that because maybe we thought we were maybe misreading the scale sample and uh we sent those to the university of or, uh, oregon state university where they have a piece of equipment there's only two there's one on the east coast there's one on the west coast and it happens to be in corvallis where they can take a laser and they can cut the the odolith of a slice off the odolith and then they can they can use like a spectrum and an or an analysis machine and, and, and look at that and we'll see some of that in just a second this is a study that was done in 87 and uh which showed that they had many many more time spawning events than we do now uh, you can see right there in in 86 87 if you look at mclean creek you're seeing fish that spawned three times lots of fish that spawned twice and if you look at the same thing in 2015 we have some fish that respond once big fish that only spawned once good sized fish that haven't spawned at all uh, so it's quite a concern so this ortolith microchemistry this is an ortolith on the right hand bottom side that you can see uh, we're actually looking at a mirror image so you can see this is the outside edge and you can see spawning event here and you can see a spawning event here on the outside edge so when you look down here you're just seeing from edge to edge you really want to just kind of concentrate here so this we're seeing that this chemical is deposited and this is the birthmark right here so we know this fish was had a mother that came from the salt water and we know that this fish went to the this particular fish went to the salt water and came back one time so there's the migration to sea there's the maternal signal that's right there now here's one that you can see that we went to sea but it's got a freshwater mother because there's no maternal mark on the uh, on on the birth portion of the odor so what this really did was this validated between uh uh the scale and the ortolith we had a very very high rate that showed that we were reading the scales samples correctly but in fact we just were finding these fish just haven't been spawning multiple times and and again this is a huge concern because you think that this is kind of what went on back in the late 80s and the 90s which drove the population to the levels that it that it went to before we went to catch and release interestingly enough 19 percent of the cutthroat originate from resident mothers so you can have uh, a mother that's being mated up with could be a, a, a freshwater fish or a saltwater male uh, and she never goes to she never goes to the freshwater or the saltwater at all she may only be eight nine inches long at, uh, as a, as an adult, and she lives in tiny little streams, uh, but is but is really really important for the production of fish that are in the salt water. So those small little step across streams, unfortunately, the department opened up to retention fishery two years ago in the rural simplification process. Those fish now can be caught and killed at, at eight inches long so it's uh that's a good thing so the last thing we're going to talk about is parasites i think it's the last thing so i think some of you have heard me talk about this argulin parasite uh it's not on any of the other salmonids it's not on atlantic salmon not even in atlantic salmon in the pens i've physically beyond i've physically been on the pen to look at that we're all familiar with cocopods on the right hand side all of our salmon have that cutthroat have it steelhead have it but this guy right here is argulus specificus it's only on coastal cutthroat trout you can see the infestation across the back right here it's been around for a long time it was originally talked about in 1854 it was described as a a parasite on a small silver salmon we think it was on a cutthroat trout but they didn't know what that's what it was back in the 1850s but 
I've seen pictures from 2005, from 2007, and in books, and, and fish will have one, maybe two. But in 15 and 16, my, my photographs, particularly my own photograph, which this is one, started to show that we have an increase of these parasites. And we don't know what they do, but we've been studying them. And we know that we see more of them uh, in that late summer through the winter period. We know that most of them that we've been seeing are in uh, area nine, Elliott Bay in that particular area, south in, in, in that area. So some of this might be skewed a little, a little bit because we might not be getting many as many people report out of other areas. We know that that's a possibility, but we certainly have seen big infestations in Hood Canal and, uh, and in the Deep South Sound. Here's a picture of one that you can see along the back ridge. There are numerous. I think the most we have off of a big fish is 107. We've seen 40 and 50 many, many times. People ask us, you know, what do they do to the fish? We don't know. We don't know. They certainly swim away. Uh, interestingly enough, we've never seen a fish with them in the freshwater. As soon as they enter the freshwater, we know that they shed those parasites very, very quickly. Uh, we think that we see a phenomenon in the summer where we see big cutthroat in freshwater streams where you would not think they should be there. They should be out in the South Sound or out in the salt water somewhere. But we think they may be going into these streams to shed high parasite loads because they've got to be bothersome to some degree. So, those are kind of some of the concerns that we're, that we're, that we're concerned about. Uh, talk about low water in just a minute. But what are we doing going forward? Our biggest project right now is in Hood Canal. And what we're doing in Hood Canal is trying to validate the same things that we found in the Deep South Sound. We've taken freshwater samples out of 17 watersheds in Hood Canal, both on the east and the west side of the canal, and on the north and the south portions of the canal. So we want to find out if we've got diversity within those streams. And then we're also going to go out and take samples in the fresh in the salt water and see if we can attribute fish back to particular streams just like we did in the South Sound. Some of the areas that were there. One of the things that we we had money to be able to do the freshwater sampling. We were kind of struggling to get money to do the saltwater sampling. But uh, as many of you know, and some of you have been to some of the fundraisers that we've had down. Uh, in Seattle every year in January, we have a big fundraiser that's put on by an incredibly generous guy by the name of Keith Robbins. He's a guide in, in the Seattle area, but he also has a great karaoke bar called Hula Hula, and he puts on a fundraiser for us and has raised the majority of our funds for the last four years. Uh, so a lot of people have said, you know, you guys ought to look for other ways to raise funds, getting all your money from a tavern. Not necessarily the case, but one of the things that we're really proud about this year was in the spring, we applied for a grant. Actually, in January, we applied for a grant from NOAA. They had a program that they wanted to try to figure out a way to involve the regular angling community with conservation. And it could be a number of different things. And so we proposed a project to involve the angling community in restorations of streams, but also in gathering of samples in the marine environment. And we put that into NOAA. I think there were 1,200 requests. They granted five nationwide. And we were fortunate and incredibly humbled to be picked as one of the, one of the recipients. So we just got almost $33,000 of funding to be able to do this project. So we're pretty proud about that helps validate exactly what we do. So, like I said, we've taken the, the, the samples uh, in, the, in the freshwater so far, they're done. Uh, we plan, if we can, to start taking samples in, in the marine environment uh, in December. It just depends on how the virus is right now. Uh, the next project, and this has been put out into 2023, we've got funding for this as well. 
when we talked about these fish having high sight fidelity on the beaches, uh, we want to know a little bit more about what they do on the beach. So this is an acoustic study. And what this is, these are acoustic tags, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, it's $350 a piece, they're expensive. And this is an acoustic antenna. And these tags get actually inserted surgically into the stomach area of the fish and they're sutured back up and they heal up and they go. And then we put antennas on a particular study beach so we can track the movement of those fish on the beach, see what they do during the different tides, how far they move, what kind of depth they're in, the salinity of the water, the temperature of the water. And then we put antennas out through the sound as well and track their movements. That project has been put on hold right now because of the, uh, because of the virus. So I guess in conclusion, uh, probably gone a lot longer than I was supposed to go, but uh, like I said, the, the Costa Cutter collision is it's an example of what you can do when you have a lot of people that have the same, the same ideas about doing things. And they can be landowners and governmental agencies, tribes, everybody, but as long as the goals are the same and, and science is important, uh, that's kind of what we do. That's our motto. We're dedicated to the science and management of wildly cruel trout. So I think that's probably it. I did you know, every every time to fish. Well, certainly, you know, I, I certainly fish. I'm an avid coastal cutthroat fisher. But if you look in the lower left hand corner, I am not quite as avid as that guy right down there. That is way beyond my cutthroat fishing. So with that said, I'll turn it back to you, Bridget. Thanks, Greg. That was fantastic. Thank you for giving that presentation. Um, I'm always, you know, I've, I've heard you uh, give the, present the piece about the site fidelity in those South Sound um, tributaries or creeks, I should say, and it just blows my mind every time um, to have such low site fidelity in that one uh, that one creek in comparison to the two others. It's I, the first time you told me that I was found it very interesting, um, but also learned some new things, of course. Um, I want to open it up to questions. Um, does anyone have any questions for Greg? This is a great time to to ask any and all of your coastal cutthroat questions. You feel free to unmute yourself. You do not need to type things into the chat. Hi, Greg, Steve here. Really interesting presentation, appreciate that. Um, do you guys have, uh, or do you or the, or the state have a good understanding of sort of the distribution uh, of coastal cutthroat throughout the Puget Sound region? Well, I mean, that's really, Steve, thanks very much for the question. It, it, that's really kind of our goal is to find out because you know, uh, we, we had to start somewhere. So we started in the deep south zone. We were going to move into the central sound, Bainbridge Island, south, you know, south of Seattle ways, and some of that area, and then move into different areas. The reason we went into the canal uh, on, as a next major project was because uh, Fishing pressure has really increased on cutthroat in the canal. And what we know about them in the deep south sound uh, gives us some concern in the canal. And in the, in, in the deep south sound, with all the different inlets that are down there, and we were only looking at, you know, like I said, primarily Little Skookum Inlet, Cotton Inlet, Eld Inlet. There's Bud Inlet, there's Hammersley Inlet, the, there's, there's numerous, there's more, more areas up by by, uh, you know, Case Inlet and Carr and those areas. The point of that being is there's, there's a really, really diverse shoreline area down there. So there's places, unless you have a boat, you know, there's plenty of places down in, in, in the Deep South Sound that I'm sure there's populations of fish that are not getting fished very heavily. There's not very many public access places beach-wise in the Deep South Sound. And so those beaches get hit really, really, really hard. But we know that, you know, I think that to me, I'm okay with that. Although there's pressure on those fish, it's getting people that are interested in fishing uh, for cutthroat and supporting that, the efforts that, for research and, and 
if it's a trade off a little bit of some fish pressure, there's areas that fish aren't getting pressure on. But if you look at Hood Canal, Hood Canal is so linear, there's not as many places. They don't just like hanging out on big, long, straight beaches. They want to find a beach that's got, it could have a stream there, it could have shellfish there. Uh, there could be just something about it that really attracts them. There are few of those areas in the canal, and when you find them, they're easily fishable. And so with the increased pressure of fishing in, 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 in Hood Canal, we felt that we needed to get out there and kind of get a handle on that fishery first. So that's why we're there. With that explanation, we certainly want to get into the different parts of the sound because what we want to find out ultimately is if we can, if we can do some more stream walking and, and, and red counting a number of streams, then you can start to kind of maybe look to some degree at like type streams and say, okay, if this stream has 40 or this stream has 60 or this stream has 10 reds on it, this stream is similar. And it's a little bit of a stretch because as you can see, uh, Skookum Creek uh, has 100 reds and Kennedy Creek has you know, 30 reds and McLean Creek has 70 reds. So they're the same pretty much, but you know, very different. So you gotta be a little bit careful, but if we can get a red, if we can get a, uh, fish per red count and then extrapolate that into different streams, it should give us the, the ability to be able to kind of get a handle of maybe how many fish are around. But what we know is there's not as many fish as we thought there were because of these fish that we know they're on these beaches and we know now you're, they're, the, they're the same fish. So even if you've got uh, a stream like, like uh, Skookum Creek with 200 adult fish in it is responsible for almost 80% of the fish in the deep south sound. Uh, if you look at streams all the way up, you know, towards you guys or up towards Port Angeles and that area, these small little streams that come in, it's not to say that they're not in the Nooksack and they're not in the Skagit, they're not in the, in the Snoqualmie and they're not in the Skilligans, because they are. But a lot of those fish you know, really are fluvial fish, and they don't go to, to, to the sound. A lot of them stay in, in the fresh water. Uh, but the small little tiny step across streams that uh, uh, people talk about, they're just innocuous. They could be in a shopping center. They could be in a neighborhood. Those raise cutthroat trout. And uh, so they all have the ability to help the population. So but our ultimate goal certainly is to try to get an estimate of how many fish there are in Puget Sound. And that, that, that's what we're working towards. Thanks. Kind of long wasn't it, Steve? <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. You kind of get sidetracked a little bit because when we start, you know, that's our, that was our ultimate thing. How many of them there are? Um, but now the, the interesting thing, and, and people tell us wherever we speak, people say, Man, I'd like you guys to do some of that work where we're at. We'd like to know where our cutthroat comes from. What stream do they come from? Uh, so just to digress for just a second on that Hood Canal project, what we're going to do is we're going to take fishing guides that and anglers from some areas down, some different fly clubs down here that we've reached out to, and biologists. And so we're gonna have three people in a boat. We're gonna do it four times a year. And we wanna ultimately kind of get 200 samples. And then we're gonna run those genetics in the marine environment and trace them back to the streams that we have the freshwater genetics on. And then we're gonna to go to those streams and find out what they look like. What stream, what stream in Hood Canal produces more cutthroat? Is it the Union? Is it the Tahuya? Is it the Dewado? Is it Big Beef Creek? You know, is it the Quillacine? Is it Eagle Creek? You know, and, and maybe ones that don't produce any fish. And then we'll take the same angling community and then we'll go do restoration work in some of those streams. And that's how we're tying the angling community to the restoration deal. And Hood Canal, Hood Canal Salmon and Group uh, and their guys are, are, are doing the, the stream restoration part of that, uh, of that project. So, uh, so Again, with that information, hopefully we'll start to get a little bit more of an idea of a population in Hood Canal, and then we'll look at some other portions of the sound and 
ultimately, I think we'll come up with a with, with some kind of a number everybody's kind of happy with, and and then the department can can manage it. But like I said, I think most of the biologists will say right now that they're pretty confident is there's not as many as people think there are. Thanks, Greg. Any other questions for Greg? I guess I had one about uh, if you have any any idea what, what you'd guess that uh, is driving that um, number of times that the fish are reproducing, what, what would be limiting that? Well, thanks, Tate. Appreciate that. You know, it's, a, it's, it's one of the main concerns. I mean, in the department themselves, when that information really came out, that was one of the things that really, really caught their, their attention. One of the things that we're seeing is, is that the streams that we studied down here in the Deep South Sound over the last number of years, it probably started four years ago where it was really, really noticeable is that the streams that we walk are not maintaining water depth or the quantity of water that they have had in the past. Uh, we're seeing fish spawning closer to the salt water than further up because they just can't get further up. Or the other thing is that, you know, nature is just such an incredibly knowledgeable thing. I mean, we don't really have any idea. It's interesting that, that I think probably maybe more, more fish, but certainly with cutthroat trout, they have to be in the, in the stream for a couple of years and their eggs certainly have to be in the water long enough. So if a stream dewaters during the summer or the late spring, early summer, cutthroat won't spawn in that stream. Uh, and we've seen that in particular streams down here. We'll, they, they, we'll find them there swimming around, but we never find any reds in those streams at all. So one of the things that we think is this low water phenomenon that's going on is driving fish not even not to spawn. I, I think that, you know, most of the salmonids will stream switch. If they can't get up to their natal stream, they'll find some place to go lay those eggs. And what we're finding is we don't think that's the case with, with cutthroat trout. We think that they can absorb their eggs and, and if they, they, they are so loyal to their stream that they won't go a half a mile or a mile away and find a stream to go into. Now that's not to say that there isn't some stream switching because we know that if you lose a population out of a stream for whatever reason, pollution or you know, no food or whatever it is, which periodically can happen, or the, the small population that's there gets killed somehow, that eventually that stream will probably more than likely have cutthroat in it at some point in time in the future. So those streams can get populated. But according to the scientists, the stream switching of cutthroat is very, 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 very small. And so, uh, again, the thing that we are really looking at right now, and everybody can have their own opinion of climate change, but we've certainly seen the flow in a number of these streams, especially groundwater fred streams. Uh, we, just, we, we just don't think that the stream has enough uh, habitat and food production and even spawning geometry uh, for for fish to spawn in the numbers that they spawned in the past, uh, so it's a uh, it's a concern. Some people have asked about the parasites. Do you think the parasites is is, is a concern because the parasites are certainly pretty pretty high in all these areas where we're seeing lack of lack of spawning as well. But I don't have an answer, and certainly talking with the biologists, they don't they don't have an answer on that as well. The thing that's really pointing their finger what they're pointing their finger at is is low water flow in, in their traditional spawning streams. Is there any thought of like synthetic hormones uh, being released into these streams or maybe they encounter that in the, the sound somewhere, just in the, the mixing of everything? Um, I've heard of other fish that are that have their or reproductive organs uh, damaged or sort of made useless. Um, Sure, you know, and I, and I can't, you know, I can't say anything on that exactly right now, Ted. I haven't talked to James about if they, 
you know, if, that, if that's a concern that they might think of. The streams that, uh, that we walk down in Deep South Sound, you know, we do water quality and that stuff all the time in them. And uh, they, they have not had any kind of water quality deficiency, if you will, as far as, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's really not oxygen deficient or anything like that. Uh, so, and again, there's no, there's no real pollutants in those streams. There's no logging that goes along those streams. Uh, there's some residences and, uh, along, uh, along some of the streams. There's some farming, uh, but the really good buffer zones uh, for, for cattle and that type of stuff. Uh, elk periodically <laughs> get in them, but uh, I don't think pollution is, a, is, is an issue, but I, but I don't know that. Kind of um, going off of that question, so Greg, you mentioned that um, the parasites that we were seeing on coastal cutthroat trout were not from the net pens. Um, that's a that's a big uh, issue for opponents of the net pens is that uh, it encourages sea lice growth in the in the Puget Sound. But you you were suggesting that this these argulids were um, not coming from the net pens. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. I've been on net pens in three different locations and have not seen an, an argument on a particular fish and, and physically been there myself and talked to some of the biologists as well, as, as well. And they said plenty of cocoa pods, but certainly not arguments. They just, they just don't, they just, they just don't see them. And uh, uh, certainly on, on resident coho, uh, not, not at all. It, it's, it, it we talked to a lot of a lot of uh, parasitologists about it, and they they pretty much are, are of the same uh, they're of the, of the same uh, thought thought that it's really specific for whatever reason on on coastal cutthroat trout. Hmm. Have you seen have you in your research noticed any effects of the net pens on coastal cutthroat trout? What kind of what kind of effect? Just any. Any effects yeah. from the and, and again, The only thing that, you know, certainly when we catch them, we'll count them, uh, record all that kind of stuff. Uh, and they swim away. I mean, that's kind of the only thing. I know that some people uh, in the beginning would try to pry them off uh, on one of some of the other presentations. And you know, I, I think if you go, even if, if you go to online, I think I, online, certainly on our Instagram site, uh, if you look through some back posts, you, underneath, they, they look like some kind of a creature from outer space. They, they have a huge calcium biting mouthpiece. And if you try to pry them off, the fish don't like that at all. So it, they, they certainly have an effect uh, physiologically on the fish as far as you know, some kind of response to, to prying them off. We recommend people don't do that, of course. Uh, but we don't we don't really know what effect that they have on them. All you can just say is if you see a fish with thirty or forty or fifty parasites on it, it can't be healthy. I mean, it it, it, it can't be a good thing. That's for sure. I I should have um, clarified my question. I apologize. Um, I was I was wondering if there were any um, if you had noticed any effects of the net pens on coastal cutthroat oh. trout. Oh, I see. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to say no. Uh, one of the places that we fish that uh, down in the deep south sound here uh, around the pens by uh, by Bremerton out, out, out through Rich Passage in that area, it's, it's one of the areas where there's some real healthy uh, populations of coastal cutthroat trout. So certainly, I, I certainly don't, in the areas that where net pens are, we certainly see uh, strong populations, small, whatever, but certainly they don't seem to have an effect on, on coastal cutthroat trout. Thank you. Any other questions for Greg? Okay, well, thanks very much, Bridget. Thanks an awful a lot to, to everybody up north. Uh, hopefully, we can get together with some new data uh, when we can 
get the masks off and be able to sit around and visit and say hi again. Appreciate everything that everybody does and certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about our work and uh, appreciate all you guys' support. So thanks so much. I'll bid everybody farewell and you can, can continue on. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. That was excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. All the best. Thanks, Greg. Stay safe, huh? Thank you, Greg. Yes. Thank you, Greg. All right. Well, that's all that I have for you. Um, we 